Vaughn, a juvenile delinquent in the offseason in his Major League debut. Vaughn into the windup in his first offering. Just a bit outside. Wild thing! You make my heart sing. You walk everything. Well, it's the end of an era. The Cleveland Indians will be no more after this season. Enter the Guardians. We'll talk to someone who stands to make a lot of money thanks to this move. But tonight, we're asking, what about other teams with Native American names? The Chicago Blackhawks, are they next? The team says no. The author of an explosive book on the end of the Trump presidency joins us tonight. What was said that had the Joint Chiefs chairman concerned about a coup and an American imprisoned in Russia, his parents begging with the Biden administration to bring him home. They join us live as well tonight. The Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening. It is great to have you with us as we wrap up the week. We are about to have a new team in Major League Baseball, or at least a team with a new name anyway. After this season, the team in Cleveland, known since 1915 as the Indians, will be known as the Cleveland Guardians. Native American groups have been protesting team nicknames in sports for years, fighting what they say are hurtful misrepresentations. And a number of teams are debating this national reckoning to change nicknames and logos that are considered racist like Cleveland's contentious Chief Wahoo logo, which was prominently displayed on their jerseys and hats until the team removed the logo back in 2018. Team owner Paul Dolan said, while Indians always will be a part of our history, our new name will help unify our fans and city as we are all Cleveland guardians. He mentioned history, and there is a lot of it in Cleveland. And in Hollywood, too, the team featured in one of the most quoted and iconic baseball movies of all time, Major League including the film's dramatic finish at home plate. He slides! He is safe! Safe! And the Indians win it! The Indians win it! Oh, my God! The Indians win it! Oh! The history of the team, the players, the records, and, of course, the name, just like in the movie when the Indians, now the Guardians, are crowned champions. Sports are known for bringing people together. In Cleveland, a new history will begin soon. Guardians is unique. Um, I think it's something that's, you know, it's Cleveland. You know, maybe the rest of the country doesn't get the reference, but that's okay. It's the Indians and always will. It's just like this. It's Jacobs Field. It's not Progressive Field. But for the next decade or so, it's going to pop up because people just don't want to let go. So as we've seen, a team's history certainly goes beyond the fan connection for critics. And today's announcement is just the latest chapter in this debate. So what about the Atlanta Braves, another major league team, and the Tomahawk Chop? Washington's NFL football team dropped its name, the Redskins. And they've yet to pick a new one. And there's this. What about hockey's Chicago Blackhawks with a Native American as the team's official logo? Let's start this discussion tonight with Greg Vlosich. He designs apparel and more for fans. First, Greg, what are you hearing from fans in Cleveland? Are they embracing the change? I think, uh, you know, Clevelanders want to represent uh, Cleveland. So I think no matter what, we're going to support our team and support uh, our city. And I think that's what, you know, makes uh, our city, you know, the best, most loyal fans. So I think, you know, people kind of understood the, you know, the logo change and, you um, I think the majority of the city didn't really want to get rid of the Indians name. You know, it, it just has so many memories growing up with your grandparents and, and that type of thing. Um, but I think, you know, everything's kind of progressing in a way. So I think, again, it's, you know, from our standpoint is more about the, the name on the front and, and Cleveland right. and, and giving the best, uh, you know, apparel for the city and, and something the fans can rally behind. How is Guardians going over? Explain the meaning of that for folks who don't understand it. So it's, it's funny. So we started our, our pro Cleveland that I love campaign in 2007. And at the time there wasn't a lot of people doing positive Cleveland stuff. And we just really wanted to showcase everything that we loved about our city. And, you know, we launched our first guardian Cleveland shirt um, in, you know, 10 years ago in, huh. you know, 2012. And I can remember when we launched it kind of having to explain it to people and what it meant and what it was and where it was. And it's been, you know, the subject of probably 10 pieces of artwork for us. And it's been on, you know, a dozen shirts of ours. We've done, you know, a Christmas Santa guardian. So to people in Cleveland, the guardian, 
you know, again, what no one really knew what it was now has become really kind of something that's popular in the city and people kind of rally behind. But again, it's, it's kind of looking, you know, looking back at it, it's crazy to see it come full circle from yeah. no one knew what it was to now it's, you know, become our, you know, our, the name of our team. Now it's on the front of the Jersey. So what does it mean to you from a business standpoint? Merchandise obviously is huge, but this is all brand new and everyone's going to want the new gear. Yeah. So it's really cool that we've kind of become, uh, the spot in the city where any event or any, uh, you know, any big moment in, in Cleveland sports or in Cleveland in general, they kind of look to us to see what our take is or, you know, kind of what we're going to come up with. So it, it was the same thing today. I was preparing for a nice relaxing uh, Friday. And then next thing you know, um, there's been interviews all day and just, you know, um, our, our store has been jam packed. And, um, you know, so we, we actually, we did this Cleveland guardian baseball shirt. You we go. have, you know, like I said, multiple other versions. We did this two years ago. And, you know, all of a sudden today, I mean, you know, it's, it's been one of our most popular shirts, but then it's blown up today for, you know, for obvious reasons. So there it is. Um, it's been, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Greg Glosich, owner of GV Art and Design just outside Cleveland. Greg, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. You bet. So as we said, the Indians not alone in this debate or in the changing of their name. A lot of football teams, including Washington, are uh, discussing this, Washington, of course, just changed the Redskins, looking for a new name now. Questions also raised about a number of baseball teams, Atlanta Braves, minor league baseball. There's still two teams called the Indians, the Indianapolis Indians and the Spokane Indians. Here in Chicago, there are the Blackhawks, named after a Native American chief and U.S. Infantry Division. And we're joined now by Andy Mazur from WGN Radio here in Chicago, a longtime voice for several sports teams here in the area. So how have the Blackhawks, Andy, been able to fly under the radar on this? They say they're not going to change. Yeah, I, don't, I really don't think they've flown under the radar because there's been this debate has been around for a while. I think it's just been more magnified now that teams are actually changing with the Washington Redskins becoming the Washington football team. Now what we saw today with the Indians, I mean, it's become part of the tradition. I know the logo is iconic right. for a lot of people throughout sports. It's, it's constantly voted the, the top, uh, top logo mm -hmm. in hockey and the best, uh, the best sweater. So I, I, I guess that you know, there's tradition involved, but I think I understand, too, what people are talking about because there, there is a respect, a healthy respect, I think, right. between the Blackhawks and the, and the Native American community. I think because of the work the team has done yeah. with the Native American community, but that hasn't made the debate go away. As no. you said, they haven't flown under the radar, but it hasn't been like the Washington football club. No, and I think that, you know, with the, when you're looking at the Braves and the Redskins, I and mean, these are more derogatory types of terms and, you know, for, for what Native Americans are talking about at this point, too. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about the Blackhawks, you're, you're honoring a chief, you're honoring a, a, a nation, so to speak. And I think with the way the Blackhawks are handling things, with uh, honoring Native American war heroes mm -hmm. before games and making sure that there's a dialogue between the team and the tribe to make sure that what they're doing is not offending anybody. There's no tomahawk chopping. Nobody's they, coming with a headdress on anymore. That, yeah, right? They did away with all that stuff because I think that's out of respect. Yeah, so where does this go from here in Chicago? Because the debate won't go away. No. The team has made it clear, but, but Daniel Snyder with Washington did as well. I'm not going to change the name, and then later he did. Yeah, I mean, I think so, as long as the fans understand, I think that as long as the fans don't, uh, you know, rebel against the team, so to speak, with, uh, with the name, I, I think they're okay with it just because of the fact, again, the, the, the respect that's going on between the two uh, organizations, with the team and also with the, with the tribe, right. the Native American tribe. And as long as they keep it with the fact that, you know, you're, you're not going there dressed as, as a Native American and, you know, the tomahawk chop doesn't also, uh, necessarily come to, uh, to the United Center, I think people are okay with it because I, I think they understand what that, what that logo means. Not all people, though, I don't no, think. No, I, I think you're right. But a lot, of, a, lot of fans, a lot of the fans that are going to games a lot right. understand that. To your point, though, I think I talked to a couple of people close to the team today who felt like it was inevitable and the team would probably at some point have to change. Do you agree with that? Eventually, probably down the line. I mean, I think it's going to, dominoes are going to start to fall. I mean, the Indians obviously are one of the longstanding traditions. They, they hadn't changed their name since 1915. Uh, you know, you've got the Atlanta Braves, of course, who are right. still uh, in, in Major League Baseball. So, you know, if those dominoes start to fall, okay, well, then a the team's going to have to re have to look at it again and understand, all right, well, maybe we do need to do this. But at mm -hmm. this point, I think right now the, the Blackhawks are pretty comfortable with the logo being respectful and with the, with the team being respectful. And they're going to stick with it. Yeah. Andy Mazur, good to see you. You too. Thanks for coming by. Joining us now, we have a little bit more on this, Leah Salgado. She is the deputy director of Illuminative, an organization working to change these Native American team names and logos. Leah, let's pick it up there with the Blackhawks. Has the work the team has done made any difference in your opinion or, or in your position? 
No, I would say that we're ultimately Native people have been protesting against all types of mascots, including Chicago, Kansas City, Atlanta, and the thousands of Native mascots that exist in K through 12 schools. I think that while there's a lot of conversation about the longstanding tradition, specifically with Cleveland in their name, we have to understand that Native Americans have been here on this land since time immemorial, meaning that our history and our culture and our people have been here long before any of these mascots came to be and will continue to protest against them you, until they're all gone. You heard the discussion about the Chicago angle on it anyway, being more respectful and communicating and having a collaboration with the native community in the city here. That doesn't help in your opinion at all? No, there's still dozens of, of groups within Chicago and the Native community that are protesting against um, the mascot and the use of the mascot. We do also know that there's plenty of research that breaks down the psychological impacts that these mascots have, not only on Native youth, but also youth in general. And we know that it's important for us to ensure that we're creating environments where all children can succeed, right, and where they can be valued and treasured, and these mascots keep that from happening. I think there are a lot of people, Leah, who certainly understand the debate and agree with it, especially when you're talking about the Redskins in Washington. But is there any name or reference that the organization is OK with? I mean, some might ask, what about the Golden State Warriors, for example? Well, what we can say about Golden State is that they've moved completely away from any type of imagery that includes people. What we can say about mascots generally, and this is true also for Chicago, is that whether or not the team has intentions to ensure that there isn't racist fan behavior, whether that's dressing up like a Native person, whether that's the tomahawk chop, it's very difficult um, for these teams to actually keep that from happening. We've seen with Atlanta, well, they've made, you know, big, broad statements about how they're getting rid of the tomahawk chop, et cetera, it still takes place within their stadium. So it's not a question of like whether, you know, teams want to keep these things from happening. It's that, that they can't. And if we can't ensure that Native youth and Native people are going to be harmed by the use of these mascots, then we need to get rid of them completely. Right. Uh, do you feel like you're making some progress, Leah? I mean, you've had a couple of big victories here, but there's a long way to go. I mean, you talked about the professional teams, but as you also mentioned, college, minor leagues, and even down to the, the elementary school level. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't just until a few years ago, right, where Dan Snyder said never will right. I change the team. And we got to say never say never. There's a big group of Native people that are um, that are organizing, that are doing the work on the ground to ensure that these things change. And, you know, this country and I think us as, you know, a group of people, we've continued to make pushes to ensure that we can all, um, you know, be safe um, and thrive within this country. And, you know, it's not going to change. I think Native people are going to continue to mobilize. We might celebrate this victory today um, for, you know, a couple hours, but we're going to get back to work. So there's a lot more to be done. Leah Salgado, Deputy Director of Illuminative. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend. You too. Tonight, we take you inside the final moments of the Trump administration. And as you have no doubt heard, there was a lot of drama. The author of Frankly, We Did Win This Election, a bombshell book that talks of worry about a military coup. Michael Bender joins us live next. More on the NFL's hard line on vaccines. Assistant coaches for the Minnesota Vikings and New England Patriots reportedly out after refusing to get the COVID shot. And later, held hostage in Russia, the parents of the detained ex-Marine, Trevor Reed, they join us. They're begging the Biden administration to help bring their son home. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donald Report on Twitter. The 2020 election was more than eight months ago, but there are some who are still trying to contest it. In Arizona, there's an ongoing audit trying for a third time to find evidence of widespread fraud, election fraud that courts and even many close to the former president say doesn't exist. Our next guest has written a book, and the title highlights that dichotomy perfectly. It's called, Frankly, We Did Win This Election, the inside story of how Trump lost. Michael Bender, senior White House reporter, for the Wall Street Journal joins us now. Michael, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Your book is one of three that came out basically at the same time. You knew the other two were becoming, would be coming out roughly around the same time. What were you trying to accomplish with yours that would be different? Yeah, definitely. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. I, I think what distinguishes my book, not just from what's coming out right now in this year, but from really the pantheon of, of Trump books that have been written over the last 30, 40 years, is, right. is that this is the only one that is going to bring readers inside the room uh, in the Oval Office in the White House uh, for decisions being made in, in the, over the course of 2020. Uh, under the hood of a $2 billion campaign, I have 
uh, exclusive campaign memos in here, um, text messages uh, to, to show readers how decisions are being made at the end of this race and they're chasing, still chasing Joe Biden. And I think most importantly here is I embedded for two years uh, with yeah. some of Trump's most loyal supporters, the folks who go to 20, 30, 40, over 50 rallies to understand why they um, kept going back and why they continue to go now, which I think is um, even a, you know more important now that Trump continues to draw uh, people to uh, you know to Ohio, to, uh, thousands to Florida, right. as we saw earlier this month. So take us under the hood, Michael, on some of this stuff. Let's talk about some of what was said. And one of the biggest quotes from the book that came out was the comment that he reportedly made to his chief of staff, John Kelly, that that Hitler had done some good things. That one got a lot of attention. You interviewed the president at least yeah. twice, right? If not more. What did he say about that? Well, the piece he said it was defamatory, is what he said. Um, but but Joe, my my, my Sourcing on this is rock solid, and I was not going to be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, bullied out of uh, uh, reporting what I, what my reporting shows is is a, is a true fact. Is that conversation that actually happened, and and the reason this conversation is important from 2018 is that my reporting showed that that people around Trump in the campaign at the Republican National Committee in the White House. Had, were worried that Trump had long given a kind of wink and nod to uh, you know to the to the white supremacist far right uh, big corner of the, of the of the Republican Party for his own political benefit, and even through uh, up to January sixth, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the, the top general of the in the U.S. military, was worried that the people Trump was bringing into the administration in those final days may have had ties to neo-Nazis. So th th these are the things that I, I th one of the through lines of the book that I that, that I unpack uh, right. um, um, from start to finish. We all wondered about that when the general was at a news conference this week at the Pentagon, and he was obviously asked about it, and he decided not to get into specifics. What can you tell us about how you were able to source these stories that certainly are attributed to General Milley in many cases? Yeah, I'm, so I've covered President Trump uh, for uh, uh, since 2015. Uh, I've written more than 1,100 stories about him uh, for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this book is based on uh, more than 150 interviews, uh, campaign texts, uh, internal White House documents. There's nothing in this book that is single sourced. Uh, I don't take anyone's word uh, for anything. That's that's my reputation as a journalist and my my sure. um, my mission as a journalist. So it, it, all of these things are 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 verified multiple times. Um, and were you uh, surprised know, at the cooperation you did get, Michael, or in some cases didn't? Well, the president participated, right? I mean, the president interviewed. I interviewed the president twice uh, after mm -hmm. his election uh, for this book. And and no, I mean, I, I've I've. Uh, and, and that's why he was attacking me too, Joe. I mean, the the, the 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 president singled out this book because he knows how many people were talking to me. That people who don't normally talk to journalists were talking to me for the, this book. And this is that's why and that's what had him spooked and, and why he was a, a attacking me um, um, over the last month or so. Were there any people within his inner circle he listened to? I'm struck by the things we've heard in your book that he wanted to do and ultimately was either talked out of or someone was able to change his mind. Did he listen to anyone? Well, yeah, I mean, this is what the striking thing to me in, in, in this book is, is we all know the story of chaos uh, of, of this administration over the last four years. You don't have to be covering it every day uh, at the White House like I was to know that. Uh, but this is not this is not a story of chaos. This is a story of the people around Trump who thought he'd become dangerous. Uh, in his desperation to hold on to power. And yes, there were people trying to tell him no. There, there, there were people who thought that they were guardrails and kind of in the end turned out to be more uh, speed bumps. But people like like Milley, um, who are, are not political appointees, um, who, were, who were telling Trump uh, clearly and precisely and concisely, uh, no, you can't shoot Americans. I mean, that's something that the president said here. Uh, he repeatedly, he wanted Americans who were protesting George Floyd's death, uh, civil rights abuses, to be shot in the leg, shot in the foot, their skulls to be cracked. Not once. It, this is something he ordered time and time again and had to be told no by right. people like Mark Milley, Bill Barr, uh, Mark Esper at the Defense Department. My, uh, if you can quickly, I, you based the title on this, but what do you make of the insistence of a lot of Republicans that, that the election was stolen? No matter what you write in your book, they're not going to either believe it or uh, read it, probably. 
Yeah, well, I think there's a, a big part of Trump's base that believes this, right? And 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 um, it takes Trump at his word on these things. I uh, and that's you know that's going to be difficult for the party. It's going to be difficult for for Joe Biden as and 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 the current members of Congress as they try to um, uh, you know pass some new election laws. And you know the bigger issue here though is going to be moving forward is that elected Republicans and Republicans in leadership positions know that the election was not stolen, know that this was a lie, but think that Trump may be onto something. Here here by using uh, election security as a, as a motivator for the base. Yeah, yes or no, based on all the people you've talked to, Michael, will he run in 24? I, I, I can't give a yes or no. He doesn't know that. 2022 is going to be uh, very informative for that decision. We know how much he likes to uh, be in the headlines. I think he would like to run again. Uh, but I think what this book shows is, is when Republicans try to decide whether or not they're going to redefine the party here post-Trump. Uh, they, they have to go into this decision wide open, and this is the book that does that. All right. Michael Bender, author of the new book, Frankly, We Did Win This Election, The Inside Story of How Trump Lost. Michael, it's great to have you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me so much. Appreciate it. A Southern governor jumps on board the vaccination train. She has a message for people in her state who are not getting the shot. We'll talk to someone who doesn't want the choices of the unvaccinated affecting her way of life. And later, a top Catholic official is out after what was found on his cell phone, and it could happen to anyone. We are in the middle of summer, still navigating the COVID pandemic and trying to return to normal, which in a lot of cities is certainly the case because blockbuster summer concerts are set to begin, including Lollapalooza in Chicago and Rolling Loud, a music festival in Miami. News Nation's Brian Enton is there for us tonight. And Brian, the party is on. The party is on down here in Miami, Joe. It's called Rolling Loud. It is the biggest hip hop music festival in the entire world. A couple of hundred thousand people here in the stadium behind me that started just a couple uh, of hours ago. The people we've talked to said they've been cooped up for so long. They were so excited. This is their first concert they've been to uh, since the pandemic all began. You mentioned it, Lollapalooza happening next weekend in Chicago. There's a big Dave Matthews concert happening tonight uh, in North Carolina. For the most part, most of the people we talked to here said they did get the vaccine. They felt safe. Uh, this is what they told us. Is this your first big concert since COVID? Um, yeah, it's everybody's first concert since COVID. So I, be, I believe everybody's really excited. Do you think it's going to be wild because people are finally out? Uh, I think everybody's going to cut up. I think you're the only one I've seen with a mask on. Tell me about that. Really? Um, well, I mean, I got vaccinated, but, you know, I just, I just want to take extra precautions. I got my guy. What's your name? Brian. Brian, man. Brian. I got my, my guy, Brian, over here. We are you excited it. about the concert? Am I excited? Of course. Of course I am, man. Are you nervous about, about COVID at all? No, no, not at all, man, because the thing is, I'm young, I'm fit. Perhaps not vaccinated, though. It's interesting, Brian, Florida has been wide open since the beginning of this, and they've sort of gone against a lot of the trends nationwide. Uh, but last week, cases up 60 percent and between Florida, Missouri and Texas, they account for nearly half of the new U.S. cases. Anybody worried there? Uh, you know, some people are worried. There have been some days with 10,000 cases a day. Some of the hospitals are filling up again. But, you know, it's Florida. People like to party. They're not requiring uh, the vaccine or any kind of COVID negative test documentation here at Rolling Loud. That's a big difference from Chicago where sure. you are. Lollapalooza, they say they're going to require either a negative test or they'll say people have to have the vaccine, Joe. Brian Enton, enjoy the music and enjoy the weekend. Good to see you. A Republican governor is putting the onus on the unvaccinated to do their part in stopping COVID-19. That Republican is Alabama Governor Kay Ivey. When asked if she plans to add any other safety measures to fight the growing COVID-19 cases in Alabama, Governor Ivey made it clear that the unvaccinated should be the ones to blame. The new cases in COVID are because of unvaccinated folks. Almost 100% of the new hospitalizations are with unvaccinated folks. It's time for to start blaming the unvaccinated folks, not the regular folks. It's certainly a reminder that the virus doesn't care about politics, which was echoed by Jen Psaki during the White House press briefing this morning. 
We always knew it would be harder as more people got vaccinated. That's the stage we're in now. But we also believe that there is still opportunity uh, through a range of approaches and tactics and partnerships with governors and leaders and civic leaders to get more people vaccinated. For more, I want to welcome in independent journalist Nancy Rommelman. Been a little while, Nancy. Good to see you again. It was fun to hear from the Alabama governor there who said folks are supposed to have common sense. And uh, I guess those are strong words for, for the least vaccinated state. I, that's right. 33% is, if, I, if I'm correct, when almost all states are at around 70% or higher. I think it's very brave of her, um, you know, to come out and say, guys, like, there's a responsibility here. It's not the responsibility of everybody else to put a mask back on because you don't want to potentially get COVID. It's your responsibility to get vaccinated and good on her for you're, doing it. You're big on personal responsibility though, Nancy. I mean, where do we draw the line on this? Because this is definitely a line. You want people to have the choice on this? I am, as you know, I'm very, I, I want people to have a choice, but what's happening is that their choice is affecting my choice to uh, not wear a mask. I'm vaccinated. I live in uh, New York State where the governor has dropped uh, almost all the, the rules. You can go where you want without a mask. You know, if someone is very uncomfortable, I'll put one on. But the idea that we should be masked again because someone chooses not to get vaccinated, this is, uh, this is ridiculous. That They are the ones that have the responsibility to keep themselves healthy. Let's talk some NFL quickly, Nancy. And uh, there were a couple of coaches today who reportedly uh, were either fired or they're in talks now for not taking the, the vaccine. Rick Dennison from the Minnesota Vikings and Cole Popovich from right. the Patriots. What is your take on this? The NFL has also said that they're going to make teams forfeit if they have an outbreak. You know, it's very interesting. You would think, I, I actually, you're the, I didn't hear about Popovich until you told me just now. Um, you know, these are people that are sort of, you know, at an age where, where it could be dangerous to them if they catch COVID. We've had 700,000 people die of COVID. We've had, I think, around 700 vaccinated people die. So that's 0.001%. And, you know, who knows if they direct, directly died because they had the vaccine. Um, you are going to protect yourself if you get the vaccine. Why they don't want to do it, I don't know, but I think we are looking at probably some lawsuits coming down the road. All right, independent journalist Nancy Rommelman. Good to see you again, Nancy. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Joe. You too. An ex-Marine held hostage in Russia. He's been in prison there for years. Tonight, his parents are urging the Biden administration to step in and bring him home. We'll talk with them live next It has been a long two years for the family of U.S. Marine veteran Trevor Reed. He was once a presidential guard with the Marines, a highly coveted position. While visiting his girlfriend in Moscow, police took Reed, who'd been drinking at a party, to sober up back at a police station. Russian intelligence then would later come in and question him and then charge him with assaulting an officer. Skeptics say the charges were a Russian ruse, and Reed has become a pawn. President Biden raised Reed's plight during his summit with President Putin, but Reed remains behind bars. Reed's father, Joey, spent a year in Russia trying to free his son to no avail. He and his wife, Paula, continue asking the White House for help, and both of them join me now. Great to have you both. I appreciate your time. Joey, bring us up to date right now. What's the latest on where Trevor is? Because I understand he's been moved. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, yes, uh, last week, a week from today, uh, he was a uh, week ago today. He was moved uh, from his uh, prison in Moscow uh, to uh, somewhere we think in Mordovia. At least that's what the Russian media is reporting. And uh, but we don't know for sure. And the United States Embassy hasn't been able to find out his location. It, it sounds like it's essentially a, a gulag that they've taken him to. I also understand that he he has COVID and is still recovering from it. Paula, are you able to communicate with him at all? Uh, no, not at this time. The last time we talked to him was uh, the Thursday before he left. And we've been told not to expect to have any contact with him while he's in transit. And once he gets there, that he would have to probably do some quarantining. So we can't talk to him. And obviously, we're concerned about his health. How do you, you know, talk We know to he him? was complaining of chest pain, um, mostly through letters. But he has been calling us um, every other Thursday for 14 minutes. And that was the last time I got to talk to him before he left. I didn't mean to so. interrupt you there, Paul. How is he doing? That's okay. 
Oh, so he's, he's having chest pains and still coughing. And uh, also on top of that, he was having uh, abdominal pains the day before they left. Okay, let's talk about the summit because this situation with Trevor did come up. What have you heard, if anything, from the White House? Uh, well, we, we talk to the State Department each week, and uh, so far uh, we haven't really heard anything uh, as far as uh, what's going on. But, you know, we're still hopeful that uh, what President Putin said would happen, uh, that the Foreign Ministry and the State Department would work on this issue, mm -hmm. and that he was open to negotiations. And uh, President Biden essentially said the same thing. So we're, we're still very hopeful. Trevor essentially stood guard at the White House, uh, protecting the president. And you were there at the White House with a sign asking for help. Are you surprised you haven't heard from President Biden or President Trump before that? Uh, no, and he didn't work at the White House. He worked at Camp David. He, he stood guard at uh, Marine Barracks, uh, Washington, D.C., for okay. a year and a half. And then he worked uh, for over a year at uh, Camp David. But... Uh, yeah, we, we never heard anything from uh, President Trump or Secretary Pompeo. Uh, we've spoken directly with Secretary Blinken six days after his confirmation. And, uh, and of course, now we've heard uh, President Biden speak about mm -hmm. Trevor publicly, which uh, so we're, right. we're very happy about that. We, of course, would like to speak to him at some point, sure. but we understand the president's a busy man. Paul, yes, as he, a mother, he's busy as long as, yeah. Yeah, as a mother, what has this been like for you to go through? Uh, well, obviously, it's been very... Um, rough, very difficult to have uh, better days than, you know, have good days, bad days. Uh, but it's been hard on our entire family, our extended family as well, and Trevor's sister too. So um, you just kind of take it one day at a time and just deal with what's going on at the, on that day. All right. Joey and Paula Reed, parents of Trevor Reed, thank you so much both for joining us. We'll continue to hope for the best, and we'll see you soon. Thank, thank you. you very much. Moments ago, we brought up the summit between President Biden and Putin in Geneva. Leland Vittert, host of On Balance, was there for us, and he joins us now. So much for the handshakes here. What's the latest with the situation yeah. with these U.S. prisoners? Well, first of all, your heart just breaks for those parents. Yeah, I spent a lot of time overseas in, in places where you could get grabbed for absolutely no reason in the same mm -hmm. way Trevor did and used as a political pawn and a political prisoner in some kind of trade. So you think about what my parents would have went through, you know what they're, right. they're going through. You, have to, you can't think about this as, as an ace, you know, in the sense of, oh, we're holding political prisoners of these Russians that, are, that Putin wants back versus Trevor yeah. and the other Americans. These are, these are political pawns. Russia arrests Americans the same way the Iranians do and uses them to try and get something or extract some price mm -hmm. from the U.S. administration. Uh, we've got pictures of Vladimir Putin here. Is Putin testing the Biden administration? Absolutely. So what can we do about it? How do we get them back? Well, that's the tricky thing. Because the courts with, all say these are, they are a sham, right? right. Everyone, every, every, all, all of this is a sham. We can all agree on that. Everybody knows that. Vladimir Putin plays a very different game. Imagine if you had a meeting with your son. You're a father and said, look, son, you need to be back at 11 p.m. every night. That's essentially mm -hmm. what Biden did at this conference. Two days later, he shows up at three or four o'clock in the morning with dents in the fender, okay? And then you walk up to his bedroom and you tack a note on the door that says, we strongly condemn your actions and hope you do better next time. There's no reason to think your son is gonna suddenly start obeying curfew at 11 p.m. In order to get through to Vladimir Putin, you have to have a disproportional response, something that really hurts him. The Biden administration has shown time and time and time again that is just against... What do you do, though, to get these American prisoners back? That would be you, more you, than... do, you do something or you explain to Vladimir Putin that if you don't, we are going to do something that really hurts you personally. We're going to sanction the pipeline that go, goes to Germany and make sure that it doesn't yeah. happen. Uh, we are going to freeze your bank accounts. We're going to delist some of the oligarchs' banks from SWIFT, so take them out of the financial system. Those are disproportional responses that would really hurt Vladimir Putin. So far, it's not something the Biden administration is willing to do. And the gamesmanship continues. It does. Leland, thanks very much. We will see you with your show. High stakes. Just, yeah, about 15 minutes from right now. On balance, 8 Eastern, 7 Central. Stay tuned for that. Chaos at the funeral for the assassinated president of Haiti. Next, we check in on a country that is on the brink of collapse. Gunshots rang out at the funeral for Haiti's slain president, Jovenel Moïse, today, forcing U.S. and U.N. officials to leave the area. The streets of Haiti 
are on fire as hundreds of protesters demand justice. Marty Hughes, anchor of News Station Prime, is here now with the latest. And this is changing by the minute. What's happening on the streets? It's a volatile situation, Joe. So right now we're in touch with a reporter who is in Cap Haitian. That's a port city on the north side of Haiti. And we have some video of this reporter on the ground today. He is riding away from the funeral uh, where gunshots rang out. Uh, he's riding through the streets. Fires are burning mm. at nearly every intersection. And Joe, as you know, tires are a common form of protest in Haiti. It is a way for them to show their frustration frustration with what they see is happening. Journalists, others attending the funeral for Jovenel Moise had to run for cover when that gunfire rang out at the funeral. I want you to listen now to this moment as a journalist for Reuters encounters that gunfire. No sé, o les dispararon a ellos. Oh, vamos. So some scary moments there. Joe, police are working mm. right now to control the situation, but what we're hearing is the city is on fire. The people there are in fear of what's happening next, and the government is in upheaval. Uh, there is a new prime minister, but what happens next, mm. people don't know, and the situation at this funeral today was pretty scary. Moise's wife was injured in the shooting, in the assassination. She was brought to the States for treatment, but was back today for the funeral. What did she say? And this is the first time she has spoken publicly since, since that assassination. Yeah. So she gave this impassioned speech today, and by the way, remember she witnessed her husband mm -hmm. getting assassinated and also tortured her name is Martine Moise mm -hmm. and today she said uh, in a 15-minute speech to the crowd of supporters that her husband's killers are still out there they are watching and they're not hiding she also said they're watching us they're waiting for us to be afraid we don't want vengeance or violence we are not going to be scared but she said we have lost the fight we did not lose the war. And Joe, I think it was really evident of the, the gravity of the situation. She was uh, with heavy security all around her. Sure. Her arm was still in a mm -hmm. sling from her gunshot wound. And also she had a bulletproof she, vest on. She thinks they're still out there, the people who did this? Because several have been arrested. Well, 26 have been arrested, but she believes the masterminds of her husband's mm -hmm. assassination are still out there. They're still pulling the springs, strings. And she thinks, in fact, they could be watching at the funeral in wow. person today. All right. Marty Hughes, great to see you. Thanks for the update. Of course. Earlier this week, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops announced the resignation of its top administrative official, Monsignor Jeffrey Burrill. The reason for his resignation? Well, according to The Pillar, a Catholic news outlet, the organization obtained, quote, commercially available location data from an unnamed vendor, pinning Burrell's phone to gay bars and private residences using the dating app Grindr. So it begs the question, how private is your phone data and can anyone access it? I want to welcome in now global cybersecurity expert Scott Schober. Scott, the first question here, how does this happen? Well, it happens actually pretty easy, and we allow it to happen because what, what's actually taking place is when we download an app, and this is certainly the case with Grindr and many other apps, we opt in or we allow these apps to collect data on us. And in a sense, our, our smartphone becomes a surveillance device, and data brokers will then buy that data. It could be from the carriers. It could be specifically from the companies that have the app, and it, it's all our information. Once you, on this particular app, if you look at the terms and conditions, what do you agree to? Right. You agree if you send a video or picture to anybody else on this dating app, they now have the right to access all the photos in your gallery, your content, what you browse on the web, your name, your email, the list goes on and on and on. It's very scary, as well as your location. And that's particularly how they did that. They used the metadata, data about data, right. to make that aggregate and know exactly where this individual was. So how do we know, Scott, not only where our information is going, but who's getting it and how they're using it? Is there a way? There really is no way to do it, unfortunately, because they, they hide it deep in. And when you, again, when you download and accept those terms and conditions, you basically hand it over, kind of mm. carte blanche. And now they have access to everything. The only thing you can do is restrict some of those settings. Don't give away your geo code. You could set your permissions, what you do want to share and don't want to share. Unfortunately, most apps are set up so the app will not work for its intended use unless you just blanket agree to everything. Right. And, and the, the big problem is they need to have better privacy laws here in the United States, especially to protect users. So there is some sense of privacy when using these apps. All right. It certainly has a lot of people's attention for sure. It's a
the big privacy issue. Scott Schober, author of Hacked Again. We always enjoy having you. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you so much. Stay safe. The Olympic Games are officially open, but they don't necessarily feel that way. Plenty to cheer about with no one cheering, of course. We'll have the latest from Tokyo ahead. Welcome back. On the way out tonight, something you should definitely see because it's just simply that cool. The Tokyo Olympics are underway, albeit a year late thanks to COVID. The opening ceremony kicked off the Games this morning, and there's a visual that is getting a lot of attention. It's actually a drone display that pretty much blew everyone away. Organizers used almost 2,000 drones that transformed into a spectacular globe. I mean, this thing basically lit up the sky and it lit up Twitter as well. One person wrote, how is no one else losing their mind over how cool this is? Certainly one of the best sites from today. There were some other images as well, though, making headlines today, including protesters outside the stadium in Tokyo, people who think sport and money are being put before people's lives, especially as Tokyo declares a state of emergency and COVID cases surging there. They think the games should have been called off. But the athletes are ready. The stadiums, as we know, will be empty. And with that as a backdrop, the games are on. The question now, will people watch? I wondered today if the Olympics maybe have lost at least some of their luster. I think back to some of the most iconic moments in Olympic history. This one, of course, is one of the best, the miracle on ice, when the U.S. hockey team stunned the Soviets to win gold in 1980 at Lake Placid. Kerry Strug's another one, landing her final vault basically on one leg to win the gold for the gymnastics team in 96. Lately, what we've seen is dominance. Katie Ledecky almost lapping people in the pool in Rio. Simone Biles has no equal. She even has a goat the greatest of all time on her outfit. These will be the first games this century without another GOAT we're used to watching dominate, swimmer Michael Phelps, the most decorated Olympian ever, with 28 medals, including 23 gold. We'll leave you tonight with a classic clip of the U.S. beating Russia, affectionately known as the miracle on ice. Have a great weekend.